This is Paul Daugherty. I'm a program manager at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. And this session is the latest in a prep tech talk series. And the title is Situational Awareness for the Living Room, Cracking the Code on Public Information Maps. This, uh, this is an opportunity for all of us to get together and talk about a very important topic. As far as question and answer during the presentation, we're gonna hold those off to the end. And we ask that if it's a question for the uh, panelists, myself or Sonoma County, please use the Q&A portal for that and chat for all other uh, commentary. And this is just a reminder for me to hit record, which I've already done. So also a reminder that this session will be recorded and we'll share the slides and the video uh, as soon as possible following the presentation. So why are we here? Across the public safety community, we've seen the advancement of geospatial tools for situational awareness, and in many ways, internal situational awareness in the emergency operations center, the incident command post, and here's just a screenshot from inside the Cal OES state EOC. But this capability for internal situational awareness really doesn't mean much um, to the public if they can't see it or use similar information to make decisions in their own living room. So think of the living room as the other EOC. And if we're not sharing uh, actionable information with the public, then we've really failed at our jobs. If you're joining us here today, you probably agree that interactive public information maps are an indispensable tool for situational awareness. And think about why we use uh, maps inside of an EOC or an incident command post because they're easy to understand. You can or should be able to ask them a question and get an answer. And again, that's only if they're designed well, that's what that asterisk denotes. They're, they can be kept up to date. They should always have the most recently available information. And they're spatially explicit. They reduce the guesswork and tell us where something is or going to happen. And for this reason, the information on a map is more actionable. So the public really expects the same. And this is important to our team at NAPSIG Foundation. If you're on this call, you may already know a little bit about us, but we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to the public safety community. We've got a vision of a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome for survivors. And obviously our mission now expands beyond the nation and we learn a lot from our neighbors as well. But we feel that public information maps play a critical role in this vision. And after a series of workshops and projects, we wanted to boil down some of the key information to help you begin, uh, begin and be successful in this process. And we look at this as the, the beginning of a much longer conversation. We hope this is the first step towards providing the community with the resources they need to get started with public information. If you wanna know more about our organization, you can go to knapsigfoundation.org. Today, um, we, we've got a good representation from across the community, from across the nation and, and beyond. We have over 380 people registered for this event. And I just made a quick map and dashboard here of, of who's here. But this is pretty typical of our member network. Uh, we see participation from all disciplines, although we see a heavy uh, representation here today in emergency management. And we also work across all levels of government. So federal, tribal, state, local. We also work closely with other NGOs and universities. And, and of course, a really important uh, component of that is the private sector who brings you a lot of these tools. So this is a really exciting event. I'm happy to say this is a, a record breaking attendance. So it's clearly a really important topic. And just doing another quick audio check. Can everybody hear me okay? I saw some stuff come on the chat. Yeah, I can, I can hear you, Paul. Okay, great. All right, so today, um, if we're successful, everybody should leave with a better understanding of some of the common challenges associated with not using maps for public information, but also the benefits of using public information maps. I hope to leave you with a checklist of some best practices that you can build for your organization and best practices meaning both technical and operational. And finally, a draft worksheet for maintaining and sharing public information maps as part of a, a wider geospatial game plan. 
We've designed an agenda today to, uh, to support those objectives. And in a moment, we'll get started with a quick hands-on session. So get your mobile devices or laptops ready. But then we're gonna cover some of, some of the most common challenges facing agencies that, especially when they don't use public information maps. Following this, we'll turn to Sonoma County, EOC and GIS team for a short case study on what they've learned over the past few disasters. Uh, in particular, they're gonna lend a lot of insight into some of those operational best practices. I'll cover off some best practices for public information maps, first from a technical perspective, and that's where we'll spend a lot of time and then very briefly begin to talk about where we're heading from an operational perspective on bringing together best practices. And at the end, we'll cover off some resources that are available to you that you can start using today. So this is a chance mostly to see if everyone's awake, but it's also a chance for you to step outside of your normal role and pretend for a minute that you are the general public and there is a, uh, a disaster near you, we'll say a wildfire, and you've been uh, provided a link to a public information map. And for ease of use today, uh, you can also open your camera, point at the QR code. Don't take a picture, just point your camera at it. And you should get prompted for a, uh, for a link to open the map in your browser. And if that doesn't work, uh, Jared will send the, the link in through the chat. Once the application's open, just go ahead and uh, pretend that you live on Grape Avenue in Boulder, 900 Grape Avenue, Boulder, Colorado. And I just want you to try to answer the, the three questions there. And it's not a quiz. And a matter of fact, if you have trouble with this, then maybe we didn't design our, uh, our prototype very well. But just go ahead and take a, maybe just a minute or two. And I'll wait just a moment. All right, looks like Mike Curtis wins the, uh, the public information competition. So, all right, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of things going on here in this map, but you'll see one of the things we tried to do is make it as easy as possible for the affected public to answer three really critical questions. And we'll, we'll come back to this. Now there's always room for improvement, but I think you'd all agree that that's, uh, that's one approach that might work for the, for the public. I don't have any prizes for you, I'm sorry. As far as, um, you know, that's an example of what good could look like, but I think it's important to actually back up and look at what are some of the common challenges. One of the things I occasionally hear from GIS and technology specialists is that they have a hard time explaining why their agency should use an interactive public information map and, and why they should build a game plan to support it. Now, I, I wanna be uh, explicit here that the examples shown here are just highlighting some of the issues we face. We acknowledge this is a common struggle across public safety agencies, and the examples presented here are not meant in any way to be critical. It's just what we're saying here is that we feel your pain and let's do better as a community. And so, as I click through these screenshots from actual events over the last two years, the general reaction we're seeing from the public is clearly that they expect more from us as a public safety agency. Social media provides a uh, sometimes frustrating but rather potent feedback mechanism. We don't have to wait for a town hall meeting now to hear that our map is confusing. And so we should really use this uh, to our advantage and learn as a community and, and do better at this. So um, I think it's important to then go back to your agencies and say, you know, well, what are these challenges we're facing? Well, number one, if we don't have a public information map or at least a game plan to support it, we might be creating evacuation zones, for instance, that use street names that don't create a closed area. Um, that's a very common thing that happens during uh, wildfire evacuations. We also might, in our evacuation information, we might be using colloquial names that cannot be Googled and mean different locations depending on the audience. And here's just an example from the Ferguson fire. Another challenge is that um, if we don't have a good public information map game plan, information can be very difficult to update once it's been shared. So for instance, it's common uh, to share a quick screenshot of either a paper map 
or a, or a PDF map or a static list of place names. But once that's been shared, especially on something like Twitter, it, it really can't be unshared. And so if the information changes and you'd like to update the public, but they're still sharing old information, uh, we run into a real issue. So keep in mind that tweets and Facebook posts often get reshared, you know, hours or even days later. And so you really want to share dynamic information that self updates. And then, you know, when we're not using maps, it's just a real challenge. Uh, long lists of road names or evacuation zone boundaries can be really problematic and hard to understand, difficult to interpret and make decisions from. Even as a first responder or emergency manager, it can be a bit overwhelming. And a map really helps to uh, tell this story a little, bit, a little bit more clearly. The other challenge is if I'm the general public, especially if I'm visiting an area, I may not know what website to go to and I may not be familiar with any of these street names and it could be uh, quickly become overwhelming. So, you know, one of the consequences of not having a public information map game plan is in the absence of good information, uh, the media and, and others will just make their own maps. And media maps have a, an opportunity or a chance that they'll be inaccurate, not up to date, and uh, disconnected from the operational tempo. And what I mean by that is, uh, your agency might be making decisions to open or close an evacuation area, and then the news is going to try to catch up and map that as quickly as possible. Now, the media can also do a very good job at this, uh, and it's a good idea to partner with them, but if, you, if they do it on their own and without a feed from your agency, they're prone to get either out of date or to show um, potentially conflicting information. So that's a little bit about the pain. Like what, what, do we, what can we lose if we uh, don't use public information maps and we don't have a game plan? Well, we can lose the public's trust, right? They can be, they'll feel uninformed or even misinformed. And it's for those, you know, for those reasons that we talked about just now. I prefer to focus on the positive, is that if we do use public information maps and we have a game plan to support them, um, we'll have information that's clear and explicit, It'll be easier to update. It'll have inherent situational awareness value. And you can actually flip it around and partner with the media to amplify your message by giving them a reliable, dynamic source of information that they, that they crave. So while we're on this topic of positive use, we're going to come back to some best practices later. But let's just get into uh, a story from Sonoma County, who've done a great job, not just providing a public information map, but really building a game plan to support it. So I'd like to introduce you to Kevin and Shelley from the County of Sonoma, who are part of the GIS team, but even more important, they're part of the EOC team, which I think is a real key part of their story, and I'll, I'll let them explain that. So Kevin and Shelley, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And we can hear you, go ahead. Excellent. All right, so, um, Really, uh, what we're going to be talking about is the um, lessons and uh, changes that we've made in our processes and our maps over the last few years because of the um, fact that we've dealt with our EOC being activated uh, too, too many times mm -hmm. uh, during this uh, time. Uh, so we're going to be going over some of those um, that information, um, hopefully. Uh, everyone will be able to gather at least one or two little tidbits of, of learning lessons from our mistakes or our um, changes that we have made. Um, and then just be aware that, as with everything, we have a wish list that's a mile long mm -hmm. that we still want to accomplish. So we're not even close to where we think it should be. We, we want to be going. Right. So. And as Paul mentioned, um, we have our um, full-time positions here at Sonoma County, but um, we are two of the three GIS facilitators that was put in place in 2008 after an earthquake drill. So that's where the GIS facilitator position comes from, and that's what we lead um, and assisting us in preparing. But it's in the EO, we, we're not full-time EOC employees, so we are working on things on the side, collaborating often with each other, and just really striving to put that operational plan um, into place. So there we go. 
So yeah, um, you know, Sonoma County, 95 plus percent of the time, we're about wine and tourism and outdoor living and so forth. But unfortunately, over the last few years, especially, uh, we've been dealing with multiple fires. Uh, we've been having some flooding and power uh, safety shutoffs. And so, um, as I said, we have some some of those learning lessons so, uh, to kind of talk about. All right. So we can um, go through the 2017 Sonoma Complex fire. Um, you know, we communicated with the public through um, interactive maps, hosting evacuation shelters, road closures, fire perimeter schools, repopulation areas. So at that time, we weren't at a place where we would really like to be, especially at the scale of that particular event. We took advantage of utilizing business analysts online, especially uh, the population business impact that the count, the uninsured and insured renters and homeowners. That was critical in terms of getting the information to see in his hands for a disaster declaration, which occurred Wednesday of that first week of the event. So we really leveraged um, Esri's products there. Um, from the onset of the event, um, we had a very high level confidence JS staff and a team uh, work approach. We're all um, familiar with one another and we're also very familiar with the plan sheets lead and team. Um, so that really attributed to our success that evening. Yeah, and um, just as a you know component of the fire when it happened, um, it was a it went from nothing's really going on to an explosion of uh, the county, uh, multiple areas of the county being on fire. So having that familiarity of the GIS staff already and that working relationship already allowed us to really just kind of jump into the EOC in a unfamiliar situation of a fire, to be honest, but in a way that we were able to start proceeding forward into getting uh, useful information out to those within the EOC as well as starting to go into uh, the public. Um, specifically for the public, what we were um, show, showing them in, in this uh, was uh, the evacuation shelters, um, the road closures and the fire perimeters. Some of the other information uh, came about further on in the event, like the repopulation areas and so forth, but um, those initial components were um, started off right off the bat, um, but we did run into some issues. So if, for example, our road closure application started crashing because we were using on-premise ArcGIS server uh, technology for um, hosting those and pushing them up, and uh, we were getting hit hard enough that they were going down. So thankfully, Esri was able to come in and help us out and help us bring it up into the cloud uh, so that we wouldn't have that, that service going down. Um, just as a kind of a little tidbit and uh, to talk, give you guys something that we're gonna be talking about further on with this year's event. Um, we were going down with that road closure application. We only had about a one and a half million uh, which is huge, but one and a half million views on that map. Um, just have that number in the back of your head because later on we're going to talk about this year's event and that number is is a little bit different. So, um, but yeah, you know, there is definitely some items that didn't work well that we needed to address in the future. Uh, and thankfully we did some of those after that event. Uh, but some of the components that we had uh, was that um, we weren't able to necessarily get access to all of the information that we wanted. We were using individual logins. So my personal login for the county uh, gives me access to certain types of data because I'm with the information systems department. Uh, and Shelly, she's with our permitting department, so her login gives her other types of information uh, that we might not have and we don't have necessarily a shared drive that we can use between. And so uh, we needed to figure out how to uh, solve those issues um, and by creating universal logins and, and so forth. Um, I don't think we need to go through every single bullet point here, but um, hopefully by now you've read some of that. Um, just as a, the next screenshot uh, is the unfortunate aftermath of uh, that uh, devastation. So this is Coffee Park. 
um, and uh, just shows just how a small part of the county and how it was impacted um, by the fires. Um, and in the next slide, mm -hmm. um, I'll let Shelly talk about that. So. Going into the archives and grab some of our um, map PDFs here, and this is where the paradigm shift away from these type of maps, the dependency, and getting into those interactive uh, EOC management maps that host that sensitive data, as well as keeping our eye on the ball, getting the information out to the public. So we needed, we know that we knew that we needed to move away from the shift, the shift of in-house PDF maps to more public centric and um, really focused in on our operational best practices and how we could um, improve on the next event, which we're gonna delve in, into here shortly. So, well, 2019 started off with a bang with the uh, flood. Um, and then, uh, so we had to deal with that. Um, and then, Unfortunately, that wasn't the only event that we had, so we had some power safety shutoffs, and then during the middle of one of those, uh, the Kincaid fire broke out, and so we've, this year alone, um, we've spent too much time in the EOC. Um, eight times? Eight times. So it is, uh, um, but one of the things that did come out of that, and specifically with the flood, um, is that we started uh, tackling some of these uh, needs that we had learned or learning lessons that we had gotten from the 2017. So right after 2017, we actually put together a group of uh, GIS folks within the county and to uh, start working on how can we make improvements to how we're doing things in the EOC. So that's where we came up with the idea of having a single log on um, that is, or a, a log on specific that's not uh, to the EOC, that's not related to directly to our individual account. So we have a facilitator log on. What that allows is that when uh, I'm working, I can be emailing out to folks and so forth. And then when my shift is over and Shelly comes on on the next shift, she's seeing that she's using that exact same email. She's seeing the exact same thing that I saw. We have access to the exact same thing. And so we had uh, that as some learning lessons. We had this idea of needing to better communicate out to the public with what is going on. Um, and with the flood, um, actually, I didn't personally go into the EOC during the flood event. Shelly did, so I'll have her talk about it more. But that's where we really started that uh, all-in-one um, showing a map and application uh, that goes out to the public so they can see where our road closures and the evacuation zones in one map where you don't have to pull up multiple uh, maps to get to it. Um, yeah. yeah, so in 2016, we're uh, pre-thinking ahead and we know that obviously the Russian River west of the Rockies is our, one of our biggest losses in terms of repetitive loss for FEMA. So through grant funding, uh, we put into place the flood inundation model, whereby it depicts the estimated flood extent from 32 feet to 52 feet from the Mendocino County line out to the mouth of the Pacific, as well as the water surface elevations and structures effect affected by the flood water. So this really helped us in developing that ESC decision matrix, right? And it really fosters that public-centric uh, focus that we were having. So we're able to um, set up these uh, preset responses involving, you know, mandatory versus advisory uh, evacuations. Also, if anybody's worked with Code Red, you know that it it's, um, takes um, some some um, preparation, advanced preparation, to get those data sets up into Code Red and have them hosted there for the advanced SoCo alerts, at least for us. Um, and that really was a success for us. And we are on, it's great to be on the offensive side. What the complex fire taught us on the defensive side, we're coming into a situation like Kevin said, um, is to set ourselves up in advance where we can. And um, this was a great success for us this last past winter um, in ground truthing that model and adjusting where it was too aggressive and where not. Go ahead and fire backwards. Yeah, so um, one of the, uh, um, 
fast forwarding after the flood and we came to the fires uh, using that same concept of the floods of having an evacuation the evacuation area is clearly shown on a map with the additional information that's necessary for the public to view um, we were able to just utilize that straight into also fire evacuation areas uh, and by doing that and having it set up ahead of time, what it actually allowed us to do differently this uh, year than we did two years ago was that we were able to have a, um, a little bit better of a coordination and dialogue with CAL FIRE, who is responsible for creating the evacuation areas and the repopulation areas for within um, our jurisdiction for what's going on. And because we had that working relationship with them and we had a map that was already ready to go and public and being used, um, we were able to work with them so that they would give us the information about what was going to happen with the repopulation uh, so that we would update the map right as they were doing the announcement of the repopulation. So there wasn't that lag in the map and the announcement. Uh, it was uh, kind of done on the, uh, at the same time. Um, we would test it uh, maybe about three minutes, five minutes before, just so that we could verify that it was good to go, and then they would do the public announcement. And so that was a really good um, improvement that happened this time around, uh, keeping everything in sync between all of the organizations. Right. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do that without using um, the ArcGIS Online uh, component of it to kind of push it up live and and have it up there um, some of the not so well so we actually have another slide that will show what went well again but on this slide the not so well um, you know we it's sometimes the little things that can cause issues so the very last one on this one that says IT blocking email attachments that was for me one of the frustrating parts is because we're trying to work with um, the city uh, and, and sharing information back and forth and uh, we weren't, or with CAL FIRE, and we weren't able to use these uh, unified logins that we created mm -hmm. uh, to do it. And we actually had to go to personal email at one point just so that we can get a zip file because those are being blocked. Um, we attempted to use um, a internal um, county um, sharing platform uh, that we've used successfully for many different uh, agencies and across the board and for whatever reason that didn't work. Uh, so you always have to be flexible and be ready to kind of go uh, go outside the box maybe just to get something done. Um, I think the last point on improvements made to the public and so this is just dialing back to CAL FIRE that and this is catching on what Paul was stressing in terms of the media will run and create their own maps and um, they steer the, the population that you're trying to reach and give them uh, vital information, especially during an event like the Kincaid fires, that the authoritative briefing that CAL FIRE was having was referencing back to our public map and the content. And so that really, um, we got feedback from um, our constituents that that was really helpful, um, that everybody was pointing, whether it be our SOCO map our SOCO emergency web map with PIO was putting up CAL FIRE, our PIO base camp at CAL FIRE ourselves. We were all coordinating that effort to ensure that um, the references were all pointing to the same authoritative map and content. All right, you can go on, yep. Um, all right, so the uh, leveraging ArcGIS Online um, the scalability component is, uh, was, was really big uh, because uh, we'll actually have a graph to show it, but I guess now is a good time to, to talk about it too. I said, yeah. remember that number of one and a half million or, or, or so forth. Um, the reality is, is that our public map that we had had nine million, over nine million. Actually, was, I was you don't want it to go viral at this time, honestly. You want it to be used when you make a map, but you don't necessarily want it to go viral because it might talk to the extent of your event and you would prefer that not to happen. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I do have to admit I was a little bit uh, disappointed we didn't hit 10 million. Um, but in all of that case, uh, it never went down. 
Um, it was always up. It was always good. Um, the only issue that I know that we had one time was I did an update and it took a little bit longer than I was expecting for it to refresh. And I had a moment of about five, 10 minutes of panic, making sure I didn't break the application. But other than that, it worked out fine. Um, and then uh, what we've also done is while we're pushing everything into the online environment, so anything that's released to the public has to be so fully hosted in, um, in the cloud. That's kind of the, the decision that was made uh, not just for maps within the county, but also our SoCo emergency website that has been created. Um, it's all cloud-based, so that if we don't, so if we get hit with something, our servers go down. It's still up and live, um, and that kind of comes into play because of uh, we've had when we we're dealing with the floods before, not this year, it was, but we got hit with also um, uh, an attack and brought down our our network, and so. Uh, we want it self-hosted. We've kind of have created a backup plan, though, too, where um, our road closures, we're editing it in the ArcGIS online environment, but we have scripts that pull it down into our, um, back down into our database um, on a periodic basis, so we have a backup. So if we lose connectivity to the online environment, we can still, within the EOC, uh, generate maps and our applications for the decision makers. To be able to see stuff, um, it might mean that the public goes down for a little bit. But we, our primary role in the EOC is helping the decision makers make the decisions to respond to the event. But a very, very high secondary role, though, is that we have to inform the public of what those decisions are. So we do have that backup just in case. Um, that we Ke can. Kevin, this is Paul. I think um, just one thing there that you raised that um, <clears throat> we might miss otherwise is, you know, this is going to come out the wrong way, but it sounds like you almost trick your EOC into keeping your public information map up to date rather than asking them to do more work. Is that kind of, I mean, obviously they know there's a public map, but do you think that's one of the keys to your success is that it's not a duplicate effort? Is that maintaining the public information map is uh, easier because you, they're already maintaining the internal one? Well, I think what we've done that helps is, I don't know if it's tricking, but it's um, we've created an internal and an external viewing application. And they look, we keep the cartography the same mm -hmm. across the board between those two. Uh, we utilize the exact same information between the two. The only difference is, is that the internal application has additional data that we uh, can't release uh, to the public. So it might have health information on it so they can make decisions as to, you know, what they need to do for transportation and so forth, that type of data. But um, the, the map itself looks almost identical and we keep it in sync. And the, one of the biggest reasons why it's kept in sync is because it's pointing at the exact same data. So you only have to edit the data once. Mm -hmm. exactly. So um, it, it does get a little tricky maintaining them. Um, like Kevin referenced, there's sensitive data populations at risk. Um, and so that's one of my um, back on the uh, not so well for this particular situation is getting third party population population at risk data and then having to process that data. It's not the county's um, human services um, data set in terms of where we already know where our data is already you know, is already geospatial reference. But doing this on the fly um, took quite a bit of time because yeah, we're not familiar with those um, particular uh, data sets and then also interpretive, making sure that there was metadata that we understood that we were using it in the appropriate manner in which it was intended to be used. I want to quickly say a few things. Um, in terms of your web apps, having it auto refresh is essential. So if somebody walks away to grab a cup of coffee, um, they're in an advisory evacuation area and all of a sudden it goes mandatory when they return um, that it's refreshed so that they do see that. That was one of the uh, comments that the public said was really beneficial. Also, when we go into an event, we notify our, our ESRI reps. Um, ESRI is notified, letting them know that, um, that we would like them to keep a watch 
watchful eye on our content and advise us uh, if we need to make any modifications for better, better uh, demand scaling and uh, what can we improve on. I know that during the flood of this past winter, um, they were watching, called us, um, and gave us tips in terms of way to improve um, our, you know, providing that uh, interactive map um, in a better fashion to the public. Right. And one of the not so well is number one is the unprepared EEOC relocation. We were um, in the complex fire. You would have thought that we would relocate because we're in the heart of um, Santa Rosa, right near where um, Journey's End and uh, Fountain Grove. And we did not get relocated. In this Kincaid um, event, um, it was, it was set, suggested, more than suggested, that we were going to be moving. And so unplugging of the boxes and then all of a sudden in the middle of the employee is I need a map and we're not relocating. So we're re we're addressing our needs in terms of how to handle right. backup boxes and software. Right, because unlike the most of the other uh, positions within the EOC, they can log into pretty much any computer and kind of do their work. We have our software installed and we need to have a, a robust enough machine. That was a learning lesson from two years ago. We needed a robust enough machine to be able to do our work where it's not slowing us down. And so if you all of a sudden have to relocate, how are you going to do that? So, um, all right, so let's go ahead and we can move on. We'll talk a little bit about the flood, um, just kind of give some visuals. Right. And so it's just showing obviously the significant flood occurrence and the stats speak for themselves, right? It's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's now it's when it's going to happen again for us. So again, the flood, could, because we've had such um, unprecedented, you know, activations in the ESC, just on the flood alone, that really is kind of the foundation of where our EOC has grown to today is what has helped us in learn, uh, do our trial runs basically through the flood events over history and it has brought us to today in terms of handling those power shutoffs and the um, intense uh, fire situation and events that have, have occurred in the last uh, two years. Okay. You can advance that. Yeah, this is just a snippet of the uh, public engagement of the um, interactive map that was provided during the flood on the left-hand side. It, we thought we had a lot of hits during this time. Um, and we we kind of compare, are we reaching the people? Are, are we getting that word out? Um, and we're gradually, we've been building up um, over, over time and getting that feedback. But this is just a mashup of all those different layers um, that we've grown into using for particular events. And like Kevin referenced, is that we've been rolling from one event to the next in a short interval that we're just taking the data that was useful from one event and we're bringing it into the next event viewer, uh, making sure it's obviously essential and pertinent for that event. Um, so that's been kind of helping us um, gradually grow in our efforts in the OC. Okay. This is just a quick little uh, glance at in infographics, if you're not familiar with it, and business analysts online. The demographic analysis for the impact of population for the flood is basically the static dashboard, I call it. And it's a quick glance to answer those essential questions. I had five minutes to create this for Cal OES to get some numbers up to the state for funding for this last winter's uh, flood, and it just came in really handy. Picture's worth a thousand words, and this was easy to quickly do. Okay. Um, what I like about this slide uh, is, um, so this actually goes back a little bit to the whole public uh, map as well as the EOC um, one. This is a, a dashboard that was created actually uh, completely um, using a concept that we got from Contra Costa County. So sharing and talking with surrounding neighbors and others around the country is, is really key and big. So Contra Costa shared uh, information with us um, and then we went ahead and uh, was able to recreate it uh, for our county and uh, this this one was up on the big screen in the EOC for a large chunk of the time and then we ended up actually producing turning this over uh, to the public as well so they could kind of see uh, what was going on as well with the number of customers impacted and so forth. Um, so that was great. Another component of sharing and talking with your neighbors and talking with others was that 
during the fire we had created before the fire happened we had created over the end of spring early summer um, thousands of small polygons around the county for evacuation potential evacuation areas uh, looking at single egress looking at um, you know where where they were actually going to be accessed off of how would they escape uh, go and so forth and we had all these zones created and we we got this concept idea um, i had an idea in my head about something and then we talked with yolo county uh here in california um went over there and talked with them and they shared with what they're uh, with us what they were doing and based upon that is what kind of instituted us going through that project um, and creating those zones and there's still a work in progress but we were able to share that with cal fire and then cal fire was able to utilize that data for inputting into their system uh, as they're kind of creating the evacuation areas and the re-entry areas and we're now in the process of working uh, with our sheriff to um, kind of uh, more finalize that that product um, and so it's really kind of exciting kind of where it's going and both this dashboard and those evacuation zones wouldn't be where they are or existing at all if we hadn't opened up that conversation with those around us um, so just some of uh, the again the uh, screenshots of uh, or uh, pictures of of the event uh, Kincaid. that's it yep the Kincaid fire Kincaid here fire. And then the uh, next slide is the one that kind of uh, exploded <laughs> in people using it. Um, the, the main image on the right, this is how the map looked um, as uh, we were within the few, the first few days of the fire. So this actually started off as a dashboard, as a map showing the public safety power shutoff which is the yellow that you're seeing on there is where it would potentially be impacted, the areas that will lose power. Um, and then the fire broke out. So then it became a map that did both. Um, and as, because we were working with CAL FIRE um, directly, uh, you know, we shared those evacuation zones, we were talking, we were updating the map before they uh, gave their briefing, that, that type of part, we were able to then when the fire started spreading instead of spreading southwest like it was and it started heading northeast towards our um, surrounding the surrounding counties we we're able to then make this a regional map so we were hosting it but we were hosting data that was also impactful for napa and lake counties and so we were able to just quickly add that data onto our map and make it something that's useful for not just us, but the surrounding areas. Absolutely, because as you know, our focus is to be um, centered on the public, you know, it is cross-jurisdictional support. You know, people who don't, you know, this event's not stopping at our jurisdictions. And we have people here that we found out during the complex fire, we had Airbnb, we had VRBO, and transportation to goods and services, they need to be notified. And having this um, hosted, you know, interactive map hosting our neighbors' content and assisting and, and doing this collaborative effort was a real win for everybody. And it just made it really easy for Cal Fire to know that the approvals for those re and not only evacuations but the reentries was remaining on a constant um, interval uh, and contact through us. So that just kept the, the streamlining of that authoritative content in check. And then here you can see where it just, uh, the first couple of days, it's just a power safety shut off and then the fire hits and it explodes. Um, by this time when it's exploding, uh, this is where you, the map became viral and it was being, um, it was being shown as the authoritative spot to get information, not just from the county, not just from Cal Fire having it uh, up, but news organizations and other stuff were actually using it and sharing it. Um, which was kind of crazy. Yeah. So. And the last slide I put in was just to simply show you that even though we have these interactive maps, this was a map that was internal for internal purposes and decision making. But I put that up there because sometimes you will not get away from creating those map PDFs, even though we, we really um, 
have tried to make those operational goals to go all into this, either in-house EOC management viewer or the public. Sometimes we need to pull back and, and create those maps, um, situational maps and whatnot for our management. So for those that are still using that PDF, yeah. we do too at times. Oh, definitely. And we, yeah. we even in our EOC, we have a big old wall map that has a plexiglass over the top of it. Mm -hmm. And early on in the Kincaid fire, the evacuation wow. zones were being drawn by hand on that uh, with the uh, dry erase marker saying this is where we need to evacuate and then GIS's role was coming in behind that and then interpreting it onto the map so that we can then put it into the public view in a, in a graphical way that they can understand. Um, and then after that initial craziness dies down, then, then that became the, the drawing on the wall map became uh, less of a way about going about doing it and they could utilize uh, the data that was being displayed in the interactive map itself. Mm -hmm. so. And one last comment on this map is using the enriched tool in ArcPro to get the populations really quickly within these um, particular evacuation zones was essential. And just those little wins, like we said, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's not the big things, it's the little things that eases us when we're under the uh, demand and pressure in the EOC. All right, so I think we're, we're good. The next slide is just our contact emails if you have questions. And then I know there's some questions that have come through. Um, and so we'll try to, if time allows afterwards, maybe answer a couple of those. Thank you so much, uh, Shelley and Kevin. <clears throat> One of the key things uh, that I took away from talking to you leading up to this event is that um, it was really building a team that ended up having the biggest bang for your buck and that um, while you've had plenty of practice with actual disasters, you're starting to incorporate some between disaster trainings and sort of like get togethers with the GIS staff and those are actually fun. Is that what you said, Shelley? People were enjoying yeah. them? Like consider them like little labs and tips and tricks that we can use on our daily in our daily operations and, and then bring it uh, to the game plan when we're activated in the EOC. Great. Well, thanks so much. And I'm sure um, there's lots of questions coming in uh, through the chat and the Q&A and we'll, we'll try to get to those at the end. So thank you so much for your time and especially sharing with the rest of the community. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, so now that uh, Shelly and Kevin have covered a lot of the operational best practices and shared their story, I just wanted to come back to some of the technical best practices that we've observed from Sonoma County and others. I started pulling together these tips and tricks during 2018, but uh, have started working with other regions outside California, including Colorado and South Carolina, to get their perspective and try to pull together sort of a, a best of here in this session. There is a blog post on our website where we pulled together similar information in 2018. But I wanted to get this to you because this is what we're most often asked for at NAPSIG Foundation. So number one, from a technical best practice perspective, I'm gonna run through this list with you, is, um, is simplicity. And I think it's, a, it's a, a key thing that we struggle with in GIS is making our maps as simple as possible to answer the question especially when we're not there to explain it. So I'm gonna start with that one. And I also wanted to mention, I'll be using examples primarily from RTS Online for this presentation because it's commonly used, I have access to it, but all of the principles that apply here, I think apply to other platforms as well. So uh, keep that in mind. So as far as simplicity, I really like to focus on these three core information needs, especially if you're starting out on your public information map journey. And these are the three common questions for the affected public during a disaster. Am I safe here? Where can I go? And how can I get there? And we find that the agencies that focus on this, both in their public information maps and general outreach, they really do succeed during disaster in alleviating a lot of the public's biggest concerns. And, and obviously those all relate to life safety. For a map, this would translate to evacuation layers or notices, open shelters, and road closures. Notice the hazard itself is not always appropriate to share or emphasize. And, you know, I'd like to know if you all agree with that and, and why or why not. But our perspective is that the hazard itself may be the hardest thing to keep up to date on a map, and especially in an event like a wildfire. 
and in and of itself, it's not necessarily actionable information for the public. If you've designated evacuation zones and open shelters and road closures uh, or better uh, evacuation routes, you're pointing positive to what the public can do. So I know as GIS specialists, we often struggle to find the most up-to-date hazard information, but often it just doesn't exist. And meanwhile, decision makers are designing these things that the public can take action on, and that's maybe a good place to focus. Um, I've seen uh, several agencies do this while well, Sonoma County and also uh, Mariposa County GIS. Um, if, if their perimeter is out of date, they generally don't even post it, but they always show the evacuation zones, open shelters and road closures. And I think that's a really a good baseline to start with. So evacuations, just some ideas here. Uh, this answers the question, am I safe here? So we want to really keep this simple. Um, some agencies opt for a red, yellow, and green, like a traffic light uh, methodology. That doesn't always work, especially if, uh, if folks are colorblind. So we also encourage the use of labels to actually just spell out what it is on the map. And then even better is if your map is address or place searchable, uh, the public doesn't even have, actually have to reference a legend. And so we got a little bit hands-on with that earlier. You know, I type in an address and the map tells me what to do. I don't even have to know what a map legend is to take action on that. Something we forget as GIS specialists is not everybody understands a, a map legend. Secondly, um, you know, there are different apps that can do this. Uh, just with an RGS Online, the public information map uh, solution is one. And Esri just rolled out a uh, zone lookup app, which is specific to that workflow. You actually can exclude the map altogether and just allow someone to type in an address. Now, also with simplicity, we want to talk about shelters. Uh, this answers the question, where can I go as the public to be safe or get information? Well, the first thing is a lot of agencies pride themselves on their massive shelter inventory, but I think during time of crisis, only open shelters should be shown. Um, the public wants to know if pets are allowed or even livestock. This is an incredibly important consideration because many people won't evacuate until they know where they can take their companions. Um, Regional versus local, you know, could there be an open shelter outside your jurisdiction? If, if that's ever a possibility, you should probably work on an MOU with those neighboring agencies and work towards a, a regional approach to sheltering if possible. And then keeping it up to date. It's important this layer stays up to date, especially if a shelter could be closed because it's full or if it was threatened by an actual hazard, you wouldn't want the public moving in that direction. One thing to consider is the use of the National Shelter System. This is a collaboration between FEMA and the Red Cross. Um, this contains, I believe, over 70,000 sites for potential shelter facilities. It's an inventory you have access to actually through the Highfeld Open Data Project, something we've talked about before. And the live version of it is, is used to track and report shelter information during disasters. If you're a GIS specialist, you'll know what this little link means. It's, it's, a layer you can have access into your maps and you can use the live version to show only open shelters. Now, I, the disclaimer here is, you know, not all shelters participate in this, uh, in this, so you still might need a local and a regional approach uh, available to you. And also that they are moving to a cloud hosted layer is what I've uh, understood in recent presentations. But in the meantime, understand if a map goes viral, this, this layer might be affected. So just understand, you know, maybe at least in your internal maps, you should be consuming this layer and decide if you want to use it in your public maps. And then road closures, how can I get there? Or, you know, which way do I go? Well, a couple of key things here is uh, road closures can be one of the hardest things to keep track of. I, I like to say it's, it's a bit tricky because it's often multi-jurisdiction and it's very dynamic. And this is something we really want to nail down in our operational game plan. We want to have a plan for how we're going to show road closures. And um, with regards to technical best practices, it's a good idea to include the direction of the closure, especially if you have a mix of uh, two two-way closures in both directions and one-way closures. Um, it's important to have a regional perspective. Um, what does the public do when they leave your county boundary? It's all equally important to keep this one updated. And maybe if possible, focus on the evacuation routes and detours versus just what's closed. So those are some, some thoughts there. And one, um, one approach for road closures that we're seeing is, um, you know, you can consider partnering with Waze through the Connected Citizens Program. 
we've seen several agencies sign up for this and we look forward to kind of seeing where that goes. But the advantage with this program is that you can set up a two-way exchange where you consume the crowdsource information from the public and do what you want with it, but you can also push authoritative information back into that feed. Um, the potential drawback is not every person has the Waze app and it's not always clear how Google Maps incorporates Waze data and it's even less clear how external agent, uh, or external providers like Apple or here or other map-based apps will use this, but it's something I've seen uh, agencies begin to use and, and can be really useful in a large-scale disaster. And then uh, just coming back to the overall simplicity concept is, you know, one map may not always fit your needs. Um, as your incident grows in complexity, you may need to add more than three or four layers to your map. And as you can imagine, that uh, can really crowd uh, the map and make it hard to understand. So you may want to look at a more tabular approach where you take uh, all your layers and kind of bin them out. And in this case, we're just using a, a story map to show um, themes of data versus trying to get all the layers on at once. But I think that if you start with these three core information needs for the public, you're headed in the right direction. And I think that's a good place to start. I do recognize we're getting close to the uh, top of the hour, but I think if you all have time, you can stay on and um, the rest of the presentation will be recorded if you have to jump off, but please do fill out your, uh, your question and answer and we'll try to get back to it if you are leaving. Okay, so scalability. Um, this is a big issue and Sonoma County talked quite a bit about it. Um, my opinion is don't host public data on your internal servers. And that's really uh, my best recommendation. Use a scalable approach. Um, if you're using ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online is gonna be inherently more scalable than your own enterprise environment, especially if you're using you know, physical infrastructure. Um, if you are using Hosted, I suggest using hosted feature layer views, whatever technology that allows you to maintain who can edit your layer and uh, allow you to do things like uh, cache control to make sure that it remains high performance. When you get these slides, I put links to the technical documentation for both of these uh, components of scalability. And I can say personally, I've uh, tested this out myself. I had a map go viral recently during the wildfire season. It's a map that's always ready to go. So it generally has about 2000 hits per day during wildfire season. But this season, a couple of uh, high profile events uh, came up and we were getting closer to, you know, 1 million views per day. And uh, the map performed extremely well, as long as there's no services that are vulnerable to high demand. So if you're pulling in another agency's layer and you're not sure where it's hosted from, you might wanna call them up and make sure that it's gonna scale to the demand. And I guess one of the key things here is that uh, this doesn't cost anything additional when you get views on your map. You wanna make sure whatever platform you're using, um, you don't get penalized for getting public information out. Security, so not just security in a traditional sense, but security is definitely something you need to address but not be paranoid about. In the old days, it was very difficult to maintain an up-to-date web map, but restrict the public from editing it. Uh, here's a headline I dug up, I remember a long time ago, where a member of the public accessed a map and made edits to the location of the fire, and this was probably because it used to be a lot more difficult to control who would be uh, editing your live layer. Today, there are very elegant solutions to address this. If you're using ArcGIS Online, you can set up hosted feature layer views put a link in here to the documentation. And this is a way to allow for internal editing, but public viewing. And it also allows for you to have a secure uh, filter of the features and attributes that are shown on your public maps. So think of it as like a live connection to your master. This is a framework that allows you to edit the internal layers, you know, in other words, behind a username and password, but expose a view of that data in a public map. And internal, I guess, um, might mean you're working off a local database, but eventually it's gonna to have to get up and into a, a public feature layer view. This is really important, and like I said before, you can almost trick your emergency managers to keeping the public information map up to date if you tie it directly to their operational map without slowing them down. And uh, links to documentation on both of those solutions uh, are posted on the slides. 
smartphones. Uh, this was a way to say, you know, mobile responsive. Um, some studies say over 70% of the public are reading the news on their mobile devices. So we should not expect that they're running to their laptops to open up a map. So your maps need to at least load on a mobile device and preferably they're, they're clear to understand um, on a mobile device in order to be def effective. Uh, one website you can use to test any of your links is responsinator.com. That's worked pretty well for me. And then if you're using ArcGIS Online, a lot of the apps allow for a little preview of what it looks like on a mobile device uh, before, you, uh, before you launch it. I've not yet used uh, Experience Builder, but I presume it's gonna provide a similar experience. And it does explicitly say it's gonna be a mobile first uh, platform. So something to look to in the future. And then finally, the last uh, S here is your map needs to be shareable. Um, many of the applications shown have an ability to create a short link. You can even click on link options and allows you to share just a specific extent of your map or share it in different languages. Uh, this is just the share widget from Web App Builder. Um, and this is really powerful because it allows you to embed your maps into emergency management websites versus a screenshot. It allows you to share on social media. It allows you to still use it at public meetings. But the number one thing is you're gonna to wanna to double check all your layers, web maps and apps to make sure they're shared publicly. And in this case, uh, Google Chrome or sending it to someone uh, outside your organization to make sure it's public is a, is a really good idea. There are other tips and tricks uh, related to this topic that we won't get into today, but you can even enable some of the Living Atlas content in ArcGIS Online to show up in your public maps. So for instance, if you're looking for an earthquake or a flood or a fire feed from there, you can still use those in your public maps. And then, you know, work with your PIOs. Think about how you want to use this, these maps in your social media tools. You can see here Sonoma County, a couple of different approaches, uh, a live link with an embedded screenshot. Uh, I can see it's even being used here in some public meetings. Uh, using your maps with your alerting systems, embedding the links right into alerts is a really great idea because if something changes, they can go back to that map and see that it's changed, even if they don't receive the next alert. And then uh, one thing I really encourage is partnering with social media experts and volunteers who can help amplify your message and maybe even um, keep an eye on your public maps and help you build improvements into it. And I've worked closely with uh, Cedar Digital Car over the past two years. So I just wanted to close this session out uh, or this section with an example. Uh, Renee Gonzalez uh, jumped on the phone with me earlier this week and we talked through uh, some of the success the uh, LA Fire Department's had with their public information maps. And I'll just show you some screenshots. You can see that it's uh, simple, it's secure. They're using public feature layer views driven by editable internal ones. Um, their app works on smartphones. It's scalable because it's hosted in ArcGIS Online and they share it through multiple platforms. And the key thing I took away from Renee is while he doesn't have a big shop working on this, the apps, the web map and the layers are always ready to go, which is really important in a, in a dynamic environment like LA. So here's just a quick example here. You can see not just an embedded map on the website, but actually uh, a embedded map on a tweet and also this even works within a, uh, a mobile device really well. You can see that there. So it's uh, me opening the website on my phone with the map embedded and it still loads and works really well. And I think Renee said he's using the media map configurable app template. Notice the use of labels, even when there's no legend available, that really stands out and is very clear uh, which one's the mandatory evacuation. And it also uh, noticed that the news agencies pick up their map and share it as well. So just a good example there. In the slide deck, I'll have a whole set of other examples you can look through um, and you'll have links to those, but I'm gonna skip ahead for now. So those are kind of the five technical best practices, uh, keeping it simple, scalable, secure, make sure it works on a, a mobile device and making sure it's shareable or kind of if you were building a checklist, that, that might be a good place to start. Um, I can imagine you building kind of a spreadsheet for your public information map, even down to the, the layers that are gonna be in there and, and what you'd wanna check for. 
And then finally, um, always test it. Send your map to four different people of different backgrounds for feedback. Watch them use it. Record the timings. Ask them to answer questions. Don't just ask, hey, does my map look good? Um, those are all really effective ways to test your map, uh, even better if it's done in advance of disaster. So that rounds out uh, some of the technical best practices, and there's, there's many more, and we'll ask you uh, for your opinion in a moment if you'd like more of that. But I think it's equally or if not more important to focus on the operational best practices, the, the who does what and when, and this is something that uh, Sonoma County shared great insight on. And we'd like to really continue hearing more from the community to build out our knowledge on what makes a good, you know, uh, a good game plan. You know, one thing that I think is universal that we're seeing is that the agencies that succeed, they, def they design their information product in advance, their, their public information map, they build a team, and they build a game plan to support it. And generally, those are three kind of common steps to success. But we know that people want more details, and that's something we want to work with agencies on. Uh, here's a rough example from uh, just from Mariposa County on their operational game plan. They've got a game plan for their evacuation status, their shelter status, and their road status. Um, and notice each of these might be slightly different approaches to maintain a layer, but it's known before they go into the event. So to do this, I uh, just want to give you a sneak preview of a, uh, a website we've stood up. It's our tech innovation hub, and it's part of a larger um, project to bring together tech and innovation. Uh, tech Innovation for Public Safety. And I just wanted to show you quickly, uh, if you go to that site and you'll have the link, uh, there's really three key resources. There's a sandbox where you can test things out like the public information map or the operations response app. Uh, there's some training materials. So these are tutorials that help guide you through setting them up, but also some tips and tricks. And then some example uh, game plans. And that's actually where I think um, we'd like the most feedback on is, Right now, it's just an Excel document that you can download and uh, take a look at and um, basically work with your team to fill in the boxes. So I put some examples in here like for public information, but maybe you could sit down today over a cup of coffee with your PIO or with your emergency manager and start building out what this game plan looks like. And if you already have a game plan, I'd be interested to see what you know the format looks like for that because I think this is... Um, where most of us struggle, we can pick up the tech and run with it, or we can talk about it, but actually getting it down on paper and having a established plan seems to be the big challenge. So this is an alternative approach to the 50 or 60 page SOP. So again, that's, that's a link that'll be available to you. Um, Jared can plug it into the chat or it'll be available on the slides when we send it along. So again, the slides are, uh, I've actually already posted a PDF copy of these slides and we'll get that out to you. The video is recorded and will be coming to our NAPSIG Foundation YouTube and all the resources will be posted to the NAPSIG Foundation website as soon as possible. And um, we're gonna do a little bit of wrap up after this closing message, but if you have to go, I guess my, my main closing message is to have a game plan. I uh, really appreciate your time today. But I think the key takeaways are that, you know, we as GIS people obviously like maps. You as, uh, you know, your EOC team, you obviously like maps internally, but understand that really they, the public, like maps as well. And uh, we've seen evidence of this even on social media or as Stephen from uh, City of Reading sent us, uh, there was even a sign there that says, thank you, fire map updaters. So while you do send off these maps into the public, uh, do understand that they appreciate it and sometimes they'll even, uh, they'll even express that and express their appreciation for the work you do. So I wanted to say uh, just a final thank you to uh, Sonoma County for coming on and sharing their story and providing their contact details. Uh, in particular, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology, who allow us to work on projects like this to pull together best practices. And one of our pilot uh, areas is the North Central All Hazards Region in Colorado, where we've had lots of conversations around this topic. And uh, we've learned a lot and happy that they, they share it with us. So, um, so very much a thank you to Shelly and Kevin. And before you all sign off, I'd really um, appreciate it if while we dig into the Q&A, you could all just uh, fill out a quick poll for us 
because we're always uh, trying to improve. We want to know what's, uh, what to do next. If you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 433042, and maybe Jared can share that out in the chat. Um, just provide us with a little bit of feedback and I'll show you um, what this looks like here. So you should all be able to uh, see results coming in. So obviously it's working. You know, would you attend a follow-up session on this topic? I understand an hour or uh, an hour and 10 minutes now is, is a short time. And if you uh, had another 60, or I guess in this case, uh, 100 minutes, I'm gonna ask you how you'd wanna suspend it. So this is really helpful feedback. And uh, tell me if I break anything by advancing, but I think you should all be able to answer the first question. And if you're done, it should advance to the second. And if we were to do a follow-up session and maybe it was a little bit longer, um, how would you spend your time or how would you want us to spend the time? Would you want us going through technical best practices and tips and tricks? Would you want to talk a little bit more about building the technical game plan, the operational game plan, or would you want to hear more case studies? And we can do a little of all of them, but it helps to know uh, from you what you want us to spend uh, the most time on. Great, and we'll, uh, we'll post the results of this once they're final. And then finally, uh, this is a test just to see if this was in a, uh, an effective uh, training. What are the three core information needs for the public? And I better hide my answer, otherwise you'll all cheat. So thanks for filling out that poll. Maybe we'll come back to that at the end of the Q&A. And I just wanted to uh, check in with Jared, who's been monitoring the Q&A. Any, uh, any questions you want us to, to bring up? Yeah, I got a few here. Um, and one I think uh, we're trying to address in the Colorado NCR, but um, it'd be good to get another perspective from Kevin and Shelley. Um, Eric asks, uh, what the process for coordinating mapping products once the event gets outside of your county? Do you have a good regional or state workflow in place? And that uh, kind of ties in with another question we had about um, who mapped the surrounding county evacuations in your area uh, for the regional map. Um, so uh, Kevin, do you guys have any insight into that? And then I think Paul might have a little bit. So I think the, uh, um, in the sense of who mapped the surrounding county, once, once in the Kincaid fire, once the fire, at least within California, gets to a certain size or within a certain area, um, CAL FIRE takes over creating the evacuation zones and the reentry. And then we're just uh, consuming their data or consuming their uh, you know, feedback as to what we need to, how we want to draw those boundaries. And again, thankfully they were using some of our boundaries that uh, we had provided to them as a, as a shape file or the file geodatabase of the evacuation zone. So they it matched our data. And then when it came to the surrounding counties, they uh, they actually shared with us a shape file that showed the zones that they had created. So they kind of provided the data for us to then post. From a regional perspective, we haven't necessarily, um, I, we don't have anything necessarily in place for it, but what we do have is we, we do have a pretty robust and strong uh, regional GIS user group. And through that, uh, we've, we've received and maintained really good contacts uh, with our surrounding counties. So we're already familiar with each other. We're already talking with each other about other from an informal basis at user group meetings to, you know, data sharing for, for things that do cross our boundary in the day-to-day -day operations of our work. And so really uh, an emergency, from my perspective, really an emergency is just a, um, it just amplifies that existing communication that you already have in place. Um, if you don't have that communication in place with your regional folks, with the, the people surrounding your county or city, uh, during an emergency, that's not going to happen. 
Uh, but if you are already in conversation, already talking about things that might impact both of you and so forth, or just meeting on an informal basis, then during an emergency, it's not unusual to pick up that phone um, or send off that email uh, to, to gather information or share data. Uh, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I would say um, I know in some cases states have been helping uh, do this, and I know it depends on like the legislation in your state, but um, Daniel from the state of Oregon presented where he's actually been hosting uh, a statewide evacuation layer that uh, counties can opt into and edit themselves. So they would have access to edit it, and then it's in a centralized place, but I know that's not going to work for uh, – for every every area in Colorado as a region, uh, the North Central Hazards Region is considering doing something like that. But um, it it's more than technology, as you pointed out. It's it's about having a game plan. Thanks. Um, here's kind of a technical question: um, What's the benefit of editing an AGOL and then pushing back to the local network versus editing locally and then pushing up to AGOL? demand yeah you know like, we honestly have uh at least within sonoma county we we have a few layers that we edit locally and push up and we have a few layers that we edit on uh, online and bring down um one of the advantages for editing in ago and then bringing it down in is, is that, that those edits can happen um in uh stay within the cloud environment. So it's, it's um, uh, as the edits happen, it's being shown live uh, when the saves happen or uh, using collector applications and so forth. So while you can set up locally hosted data through a REST service to edit in a collector app or survey one, two, three, or so forth, um, you uh, you have we'll have a lag and it's a few more steps and, and hoops that you have to jump through um, so staying up in AGO uh, simplifies that uh, and then uh, where it does where why at least we found some problems with going in just AGO is that as GISers we are really familiar with how to edit in a, in, in a desktop environment so if it if it requires a lot of data editing, um, uh, digitizing, and so forth, it might make sense to do local edits and then push it up into the uh, um, into the cloud. Um, so sometimes it depends on the layers. At least what we've been finding, we we don't have a um, we use different approaches depending on the layer that was being edited and and utilized. And the time frame. And the time frame. The, the yeah. turnaround time is is a, is first, you know. Um, so the demand first, and then um, then we go from there. Great. Uh, it's you. really helpful. Yeah, I think. Uh, and keep in mind, you know, you can always hybridize. Like uh, you can edit feature layers inside of desktop, but if it's really about where the data lives, a place where everybody can get access to it and the edits are made quickly and shown live is is always going to be preferred and and uh emergency management environment. So I agree with you. Um, one question about the PSPS layers. Um, did you track those or archive them periodically to look at after action to look at how the outage and impacts evolved over time and how that affected anything? Have, were, were you able to do that at all? We have a repository from um, each of the PSPS events that we've had um, in Sonoma County. And um, we have discussed them in terms of just the repeated coverage area. It's not like the topology is going to be changing. It's, we can start getting a little bit predictive ahead of time to get prepared in those more common areas that, you know, for every um, potential power shutoff, where the, where the most the frequent areas, I would say. In the county are so we've become very familiar in terms of our population at risk in those areas our hospitals our schools um, you know so EOC management's kind of seeing a trend there in terms of where those are at and how we best fit our EOC operational practices and goals to meet those 
And, and for those of the, those of you not familiar with California's uh, craziness, uh, PSPS is the public safety power shutoff that utilities are doing to try to preempt uh, wildfire ignition during high wind events. And it's uh, something that's been done in the past, but this year, uh, this season really came to a head. And uh, I think Sonoma County had a, and uh, several other counties had good game plans for, for dealing with that, so. Right. Um, there's some, there's a question about making a web map public, what, um, what kind of settings and stuff you need. I, I think I would just, um, say, check the ArcGIS online help. And also we're going to be sending out the slides here in, uh, just a few minutes. Um, I'll add that link to the chat. Um, and there, there's some resources there that people can check. Yeah. And I'd say like a, a tip that I always do is I try to share the web map publicly first. And if anything's broken, it's usually there. And uh, you can usually override any of the layer settings. Uh, the only other exception, like I said, is if there's a, a layer that requires a subscription, you know, coming from the Living Atlas, there's some extra steps there. But the links to the documentation should be in there, and I hope that helps. And uh, just reach out if, you, uh, if you're stuck. Yeah, and, that and do leverage your uh, ESRI reps as well. Let them know that we are in an event, that an event is in progress. And they will um, and ask them to advise you because um, they have access to your AGOL account and they could advise you as to the performance standards as well. So it never hurts to keep continuing to learn. We always do with every event and we welcome input. Yeah. Um, there were several questions about uh, training opportunities to learn more about um, public information maps, um, AGOL, and then um, there's also some more on uh, kind of the larger cloud uh, cloud hosting of data. Um, I guess I would, I would refer you to the NAPSIG website. We have, we've done several um, webinars similar to this one. Uh, so that's a good resource. And also the Esri Help um, is a great resource. Uh, they have different tutorials and stuff you can look through. Uh, do you guys have any uh, specific training resources that you guys reach out to? Oh, one other one I might mention is the NIFC uh, National Incident Fire Center. Um, they have a they have a really great website for um, their GIS, uh, wildfire GIS. Uh, you know, setting up your feature hosted, your views. Um, there's, there's just a lot of great arcade. There's, there's just, there's just a variety of different, uh, it's the smallest of things when you're in that event those tips and tricks and, and um, we're more, I'm more than happy, Kevin's more than happy to share with some of the, the resources that we have stumbled across during our times in the EOC and, and, and being prepared. But it, again, it comes back to those small little wins. Yeah, great, thank you. And I know uh, somebody had mentioned something about Colorado. Um, I currently live in Colorado and there's a great uh, GIS, um, listserv that you can join if you just i uh, don't know the name of it off the top of my head but if you do a google search for gis listserv colorado there's a great resource that people are always sending out questions and if you have a question you can ask and uh and help all right i think that's that's about it i think as far as the questions go there's a couple lingering ones here we may uh try to type some uh, answers into, but um, I think we're, since we're running pretty late on time. Yeah, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll cancel the recording here and uh, we can try to wrap up any, any loose ends, but I really appreciate all your time. Again, especially uh, Shelly and Kevin for sticking on longer with us. And uh, I look forward to when we can all meet in person sometime soon. Oh, definitely. You're welcome. All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks everyone.